Here we go. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Keep the Mic On. I am one of your hosts, Simply Sherry, and if this is the first time you've ever watched or listened, this is the perfect episode to watch and or listen. You know, we if you know for no, you've been with us, you know we are live on Facebook and YouTube Live. Hello, everybody. If you are new listening to us via Spotify and podcast, Hello, if you want to see what we look like. We just told you where we are every Sunday at 7. <laughs> so we, we we welcome you and we say that this night is one of our favorite nights we do. Every once a quarter, roughly, there is a fifth Sunday. And this is when we take the opportunity to interview one artist that we all want to talk to. And that is tonight. So we are very excited. You will get a little taste of all of our interviews I am going to go ahead real quick and kick it to the poet in residence at the Anthonium. Oh, I was I was not expecting it to be even, kicked it to. I was wasn't expecting to be kicked it to. So, um, <laughs> so good Sherry, listen, so simply Sherry's week is uh from behind the microphone, right? So she can talk about everything and right, anything right. you want to talk about, right? So my week is called Poets and Platforms, where I interview poets who have platforms for the arts. And tonight I'm super duper excited because my friend and will be yours mm -hmm. um is the feature for tonight. So I don't even say who it is. I'm just gonna say that she should have been but you should be on our email list. You should be liking, following, subscribing, yep. and yep. Let me say that we volunteer our time um, every week since March 2020, and Oof. everybody who comes on, they volunteer their times as well. But these platforms are not free. So if you would like to help us continue to keep the mic on, all you have to do is drop us some dollars in our cash apps, rolling at the bottom of the screen. Keep the mic on. That's what I'm saying. Everybody says that this is a masterclass. We didn't say it. You said it. So right. since you have coined this as the masterclass, we make sure mm -hmm. that we are bringing all the masters on here. And this should not be free. The jewels that the artists are dropping in here, trust me, this should not be a free platform. I'm that saying. is right. That is right. So I am super duper excited to kick it to Girl Genius. Woo, 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 woo. Yeah, I, did it I, I had to unmute myself. I was doing all the technical behind the scenes share thing, making sure all of you are here to watch this evening. Hi, I am Girl Genius. Good to meet you. If you if you don't know who I am, we'll kind of virtually meet you. Uh, I, my segment is the first week of every month, and it's called "Let's Talk About the Dot Dot Dot." Usually books. So that's what I am. Now, I'm going to say this before I kick it to our other host. Now, tonight's guest was one of our first, was actually, I believe, my first guest? No, no. I think second or third. Hmm. I thought it was in, like, June that first year. Mm, I don't know. I my, could be wrong. My first, one of my first couple of guests on this show when we started back in 2020. Yep. On my segment, though. So um, I, I I felt like I feel it's fitting to have brought them back for a roundtable. And I'm super duper excited about this. So I'm not going to do introductions because that's not my that's not my job tonight. I'm not going to do the introduction, although they don't need much of one. I'm what I'm going to do is kick it to. My co-host above me. See, this, the pointing part is easy today because I don't have to figure out in which direction. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the pointing that get you. It's, it's, the, it's, the, yeah, it's the pointing that gets you. I'm I'm going to point up because it's the easiest thing to do, and right. um, and and pass it on to my other co-host, Miss Cayenne. What's up? What's up? Happy, happy Sunday. I am Miss Cayenne. I'm a poet and I know it. And my segment is passion projects, right? So when we talk about the why, kind of get behind, um, get to the story of a person and, and, and how they come to this place of their artistry, but also to talk about the ups and the downs of the, the passion of their work. 
and as you if you've heard the theme already in all of the introductions there is a brewing excitement for tonight's guest and so i have the honor and the privilege to read this bio and again you know this is a, a, you know a little drop in the bucket to who this person is but i'll give you an idea and i would love to read and share information related to our esteemed guest tonight. An award-winning poet, teaching artist, and advocate for child abuse prevention, the LGBTQIA community and mental health awareness named a pioneer of poetry by the National Underground Spoken Word Poetry Award in 2015. C has the dynamic skill set of a performer and host. They have mesmerized audiences at Angelina College, Howard University, Prince George's County Community College, Thomas Jefferson University, Bus Boys and Poets as a featured poet and host, Studio 2001, Art Gallery, The Anthenaeum, and The Torpedo Factory, just to name a few. They have partnered with the Northern Virginia Association of Fine Arts, Carlisle House Historic Park, producing annual events highlighting African-American excellence and leads their popular discussion-based writers workshop, Writing to Wellness, that uses poetry. It uses poetry as a tool for healing when navigating childhood trauma with, well, with Creative Suitland Art Center. Um, heard and smile their work as a community community organizer has afforded them opportunities to educate adults on how to respond and react to child sexual abuse through darkness to light stewards of children and becoming a board member for touch me i'm telling or tmit in addition they have received honorable mentions from world childhood foundation usa buddy speaks in the harvest ministries publications by the zebra and more. C is a true force of nature and a necessary voice for uplifting the community and inspiring hope. Witnessing him, them perform teaching in the classroom or during a speaking engagement is experiencing love and action. Non-binary ladies and gentlemen, C. Alexandria Bernard Thomas. <laughs> Oh, goodness. Hey, beautiful friend. How are you? I am exquisite. How are you? I, I am the same. I am the same. Listen, we all are, are super excited. The audiences have been revved up for the last couple of weeks. I'm going to exit and give you the stage, if you will, so you can wow us and woo us as you always do. <laughs> um. All right. No problem. Um, hello, everyone. My name is C. Alexandria Bernard Thomas. And you know, when I hear my bio, it is, I get kind of, I don't want, I want to say embarrassed. And because it's just, and I blush because hearing all of that and when it's just, it's, it's a lot. And, but I'm very thankful for the journey that poetry and art has taken me on. And I wouldn't be who I am today had I ignored paper and pen. And I must, must pay homage to those artists before me and those ancestors who walked the ground for me to stand on in order for me to do what I am doing and to afford me these opportunities. And it's just, it's, it's, it's powerful. Um, so I'm going to do a poem and we're gonna get back. Well, I'm gonna do, I don't know, I'm gonna do a poem. <laughs> and then we're gonna chat it up a little bit because I'm interested to see what the women are gonna pick my brain about. So this first poem is titled Zephyr. And for anyone who is unfamiliar with the word Zephyr, Zephyr, it comes from the Greek god Zephyrus, who is the god of the gentle breeze of the west wind. And Zephyr is a gentle breeze. And this poem is written in the form of pantoum. And a pantoum is a any length poem, but the stanzas are all four lines with a repetition of the second and the fourth line moving down to the 
next stanza and the second line becomes the first line and then the fourth line becomes the third line and generally the first line it ends the poem that was a mouthful i know um so this poem was written in honor of my growth and where i am and where i'm going and me accepting myself more so with arms open eyes closed wide inhale and leap Fervent are the hands reaching to heaven. Steadfast is the soul against the back of Zephyr. Give in to this salvation where air meets sound. Fervent are the hands reaching to heaven. Eye to eye with dawn, angels orchestrate light. Give in to this salvation where air meets sound. Architect of wind becomes guardian of flight. Eye to eye with dawn, angels orchestrate light. Hold tight to the breeze, it knew you before the womb. Architect of wind becomes guardian of flight. Majestic are the wings sculpting air into shape. Hold tight to the breeze, it knew you before the womb. Carrying you where mountaintops await your arrival. Majestic are the wings sculpting air into shape. Relax your legs. This moment, you won't need them. Today, you're a miracle. Mountaintops await your arrival. All you need to do is fly. Even if it seems impossible, relax your legs. This moment, you won't need them. The first step, easy. Defeating comfort's pull, fly. Even if it seems impossible, you've got this. Next, learn to trust the breeze beneath your wings. The first step, easy. Defeating comfort's pull. Keep your eyes open. Eyes closed wide. Inhale and leap. Thank you. And that is Zephyr. And one of my favorite poems, honestly. Hi, Gigi. You're muted. I know. I realized it's a <laughs> second too late. I realized it about a half second too late. <laughs> it's like, camera on. Mike, not so much. <laughs> How are you, my dear? I'm fantastic. It is so wonderful to have you back on the show. Well, it's so, good to be had back. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So uh, for those in the audience, uh, so I, I'm I'm actually looking to double check my life. I want to say you probably were my second guest ever on this show. I'm scrolling back to Instagram to figure out if if that's the case, but I believe you were my, you were my second guest. I believe. I think I was. It was actually it was a dual night that night. To be honest with you. Yeah, we started in March. It was it was cold. I believe you were my my second guest. So so if this interview, what I decided to do, and, and and this is it because I already asked you the questions, and this is an infancy of we didn't do things right. So I have to do sort of the truncated interview tonight because it's not it's a roundtable night, and everybody wanted to talk to you too. So this is going to be great. So I sort of reconfigured some of these questions. And we're still going to talk about writing and books and things, but you have so many things on your plate in regards to the writing that this actually makes it like really easy. One of which is let's start, let's start talking about this poem, this one, the one you just did. Let's start with talking about four poems. <laughs> so <laughs> why four poems, right? You know I have a special place in my heart for form poems. Yeah, I know, and I knew you would appreciate this. I really knew you would appreciate this poem. Um, I wanted to discover myself more, right? And I wanted to explore where I was and where I was going and where I am at the same time because that's what Virgos do. And we, and I, said, you know, I just didn't want to just sit down and just write a poem. I actually wanted to have it in a structured way. 
and Pantoom is it's not a difficult poem, but it is a challenging poem and because it is a very, very, very tight formula that you have to follow. And with that, I say, you know what? My life is a tight formula. Why not put the two together? So when, you know, with these powers combined, let's see what happened. And this poem, like I say, was very, it was on time at my in, during my life because it was, this is when I actually quit my job of 15 years in dentistry to pursue full-time artistry. And Zephyr at another, it was Zephyr at another pantoon that actually came to exist, but Zephyr actually spoke more and it spoke louder and it spoke more powerfully than any poem I feel that at, during that time that I wrote, because it actually, I was taking a risk and I didn't know where this risk was going to be. And I didn't know what this risk was going to do. I didn't know what growth or lack of growth this risk was going to present. And honestly, both sides, I accepted and embraced both. And because that's honestly how you learn, because one cannot exist without the other. And when I wrote the poem, I said it has to be in a form poem. It has to be it has to be a form of poetry. And Pantoon was like my first choice. It was my first. I don't know why it was my go to, but it was my first choice. And you I get honestly, to the things sometimes. Right. And because I also think because with the repetition, like I had to keep telling myself, you're going to make it. You're going to be fine. You're doing the right thing. Pantoon, you repeat the lines. And it was like it was a repetition of me keep reminding myself to keep going no matter what to look back. It's OK. Look what you're doing. Look, you're here. Don't give up. Keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And so that's how I chose the, for this form of poetry to write this poem for that. That moment in my life. I asked that I asked that specifically because I kind of knew where this was going to go that and we don't get that many on here, believe it or not. We don't get a lot. We do get people who, who, who like doing them and write them and whatever. But th this is a good segue to your resume and your bio is ridiculous. One of the things I want to pull out and the reason, you know, kind of how we're going to tailor this interview a little bit is you teach writing to wellness. You yes. help people write, right? Are I you, do. we're going to talk a little bit about writing to wellness specifically when you do writing to wellness, because I want to tell, I want people to know what it is and how this works. Like, do you use form homes to help? Do you? I do writing. When I do any writing session with writing to wellness, I try to introduce a new form of poetry to the class or to the people in the class. And then because I'm Chris, I, I slap a time constraint on it. <laughs> and sometimes that time constraint could be five minutes. It could be 10 minutes. It could be 15 minutes. I just and I do that because the history with writing to wellness is actually it stems from childhood trauma and is built from my childhood trauma. And with trauma and with you go through things, you don't have time to actually to sit there and figure things out. You have to be on. You have to be critically thinking. You have to be there, right? right. And so that's why I put the time constraint on these writing prompts. It is actually to get them to really to force them to look at what's going on at that present time with them. And this is a discussion-based workshop. And so... We have the conversation. It's always talking, it's, and it always starts with something that happened in my life and with me. And just so everyone would know, I am not a therapist. I don't pretend to be a therapist. I give elements of my life that happened to me from the past and present and right now, and tips and tools that my therapists have given to me, and I pass that on in this class. And then we talk about it. Then we debunk it. Sometimes we lift each other up. Like we really became more like of a lifeline than, a, than an actual writer's workshop, to be honest with you. And then we, I find a poem that actually fits the topic. We read the poem, dissect it, break it down. And then we write a poem based off of the conversation and that poem with a form of poetry. The hardest form of poetry that I have ever introduced in this class is a triptych. And yeah. And for those of you who don't know, a triptych is a three column poem. Each column reads as its own poem, but when you read the, um, the poem across, it forms the fourth poem. 
And it's it is like, yeah, it's like trick picks, contra consoles, all of those. Yep, they're yes. a pain in the butt. Yep. <laughs> it, it is a science <laughs> to this. And I've had, I think, like maybe one or two who mastered it on the first, absolute first try. And what's also shocking about this class, or even amazing, is that some of the people who have actually attended this class, because it's not just for writers, it's for anyone. Um, some people have actually come in here and actually written their first poem, period. Some people have actually come in here, written their first poem, and actually entered it into a contest or submitted to a journal and was, and was accepted and actually won awards. Some people have actually written poems based off of this entire workshop for the first time have actually published their first book. That's the power of writing to wellness because it actually helps you to look at your trauma and the cliche line and term, you know, poetry saved my life. And it's a, it's a very necessary cliche, though, but that's what this workshop does. It actually forces you to look at your life, to look at your trauma. It lets you know that you are not alone with your trauma and that your trauma does not stay in your childhood. It does follow you to your adulthood. But what are we going to do with that trauma? You know, we don't want to degrade our trauma. We want our trauma to know that it, it too is part of us, but it doesn't control us. And I always say your pain may know you, but it has no power over you. That is what this workshop is built upon. I'm so glad you answered that that way. You answered like a good couple of my questions. So I was going to ask you to explain what this is specifically. But now let's let's back up a little bit. So what prompted you to, well, First of all, when are these available? Because I want to put this out there. Like, if people want to do writing the wells, I'm going to put it out there. Like, when did these things happen? How often? Well, writing, writing to wellness came into existence at the dawn of the pandemic. So, writing to wellness is two years old, <laughs> and it um, came to exist at the dawn of the pandemic. And I, and I was actually in my bedroom, and I fell into a spell of depression. And I did what I always have done, journaled, wrote poetry, read poetry, dissected it, talked to myself <laughs> and whatever, right? And answered yourself because you're yeah. supposed to. And sometimes, you, and sometimes answer myself, right? So that's how writing the wellness came to exist. And I was like, you know, if this is helping me, and the thought was, if this helped me, I can't be the only one feeling something right now. And I can't be the only one who is feeling something, period. And I know I'm not. It's, but how can I make this or package this in a way where it could actually be beneficial for other people? And that's how it came to exist. So it started out with a conversation with people, um, what my therapists and psychiatrists have given me. Um, read the poem. Let's have a free write about what we've discussed in the first half and then read another poem or read just one poem and then just introduce the writing prompt. And I was shopping this around to several organizations and the, or the one organization that picked it up, shout out to Creative Suitland. And they were looking for something for the pandemic. They had they just went, they had just had their grand opening and literally a month later had to close down because of the pandemic. And all their programs went virtual and they was looking for something for everyone, you know, to like to keep them grounded and for something for mental wellness and for wellness and writing the wellness was something that was on their radar. Enter you, <laughs> right. Enter right. Inter C. Thomas with the answer. <laughs> and um, since then, writing the wellness to this day, it is still housed at Creative Suitland. And currently, Miss Kimby Miller is the facilitator for the workshop. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's every second Monday. And it's from 6 o'clock to 7.30. And I also offer private classes and on the last Sunday of the month. And we just, we write and we talk and we just get it all out. We just become free. And I made a, a statement a while ago um, to one of my classmates, to one of the classmates, you know, this is the best form of trauma bonding, honestly, ever, because we're, we're trauma bonding, but we're healing while we're trauma bonding. Like we're acknowledging the bondage that our trauma has put on us. And we're not making any mistakes by ignoring it you know like i always say healing is very powerful and if you're not fighting thin air you're not healing properly and you may not be ready to look at a certain aspect of your life but and that's and that's okay 
you still have to acknowledge it by talking to it. And I even like I give certain parts of my trauma a name. I'm like, hey, Bob, say, for instance, hey, Bob, I'm not ready for you right now. Wait your turn. When I'm ready for <laughs> you, I just want you to know it's going to be me and you when I get ready for you. I didn't mean to laugh. Bob is like the most. It's the funniest thing in the world. I, I totally get it. I didn't mean to laugh. Bob just caught me off guard. That's fantastic. That is absolutely that is absolutely fantastic. We were just talking about, didn't you just, we were just talking about riding the wellness before we started the interview. Because So for people in the audience who don't know, so we usually have about 10 minutes, maybe 15 sometimes before the show starts to kick it with our our artists and we, we were all just discussing writing the wellness because you would just say you you were, you were teaching a, a class today yes yes i literally an hour before i concluded i actually had to change the time just so i could make sure i was here on time i appreciate you doing that i understand i understand time constraints but we, we we love having you here um I probably have a couple of more questions and I'm going to let, I'm going to flip it to uh, the next host. Probably have three, four, four, three, four questions. I'll flip it to the next host because I want to give them time to be able to talk to you thoroughly. But um, getting back to this, one of the things, let me see how to, how to ask this. So what, aside from addressing the trauma, right? And Aside from addressing, like, how how difficult is that? I mean, because I I know you talk about yours a lot through your advocacy work, right? How difficult is that with other people? Like, do you find that there's a willingness to sort of address this stuff in writing? Do you find that it's, it's easier for people to do that? Um, you know what I mean? Is it is it is it is that is that the the easiest approach? Because I know sometimes, like, I'm, I'm, let me re rephrase this. Like, I know sometimes when I'm going through stuff, the easiest thing for me to do is just write some stuff down, and nobody may ever see that. You know what I'm saying? But I haven't put that out in the air, and I'm not discussing this with someone else, and I'm not sharing this on a stage necessarily. It depends on what it is, right? Um, but I know if I don't do something with that, then it's going to manifest itself in other ways, right? Mm -hmm. Is it, I know it's a process, but do you do you find it sometimes a difficult thing to do? Because as you're taking in these, as you're, as you're working with people, you're taking in these things as well. Yes. I have put myself in the line of fire on purpose and willingly. It is, it, and as an advocate, especially when sharing my story and hearing other people's stories, it can be very taxing. It can be very triggering. It can be very upsetting. And it can be sometimes it can catch you off guard with some things. And it can also bring things to the forefront that was suppressed, you know, right? And so some days I will just sit in my room and lay in the bed in complete darkness and quiet and just listen to whatever sound there is in my apartment or even outside, just something so my ear can catch that and concentrate on that, just to keep me somewhat grounded so I can actually have some kind of focal lifeline type of thing. Um, I have also learned with this, once I do that, it is very important for me to actually to write what I felt versus keeping it in, because that was one thing that I've always done. Um, as a child, I was, forced to keep things to myself and to keep it in and you know not to share it and that was one that was when i became older that was a promise i made to myself that i would not do that anymore because of the harm and the damage that it not just caused me but caused other people and so i write it down then once i write it down i go literally i go right to my bathroom mirror and i actually read it out loud to myself and I read it out loud to myself because that right there, it tells for me, if I can face myself with this and if I can actually read this out loud to me, then everyone else outside of me can't cause me any harm and I don't, won't have any fear to share that with anyone. Because if I can share it with me, I can share it with them. Depending on the gravity of it, because, cause, because some things you don't right. want to share with everybody, but some things, you know, need some things with me and with other people need to be shared and that's one thing also going back to writing the wellness i don't <clears throat> i don't stifle anyone 
I let them just be yourself, talk, get it off your chest, do you. Like, if, for instance, it's one class, it's one class, one, one of my students in particular, their entire life, they were always told to shut up and not to talk and not to be anything. And I told them in this class, that's not the case. You talk, you laugh, you scream. If you talk for 20 minutes, you talk for those 20 minutes. I want you to know that you are not there. This is a very safe space for you. And that's what I try to present myself as when I do this, when I do this work, because they need that outlet. I need that outlet. Everyone needs that outlet. And sometimes writing don't even take place. So that that doesn't surprise me much. Sometimes you just need, sometimes you need to write, sometimes you need to hear. I think that's the answer I was trying to get to. Like, like yeah, exactly how you just explained it. I am excited about this. Um, I, I'm, I want to, I don't know how to pick your brain. I don't, I don't, I don't have a lot of time left in my portion of the segment, and, but I, I want to kind of keep this door open so if somebody else wants to come back around to talking about some of the other aspects of this. But I do have a couple, I do have like one last question for right now. Um, okay. Normally when we do this portion of the interview, when we talk about books and that kind of stuff, I, I ask, um, I usually, no, 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 no. I changed my mind. What question I'm asking? Well, I ask you this. I know you have books. We've talked about them. I know you have CDs. We've talked about them. So I'm going to end with what do you have or do you have anything on the horizon? And you better say yes. <laughs> I'll flip the question. What what do you what 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 is your next project look like? I am working on another book. I will say that I am working on another book. Yes, I am. Um, I think this one is going to be different from what I've done before because it's been a lot of soul searching, a lot of reconcili a recon reconciliation within myself, um, the acceptance that I won't get apologies from people who have harmed me and that there won't be, and my apologies to people who I've harmed won't be accepted. That's what this book is going to talk about. That's what it's going to focus on. I mean, since, since the last time you did a book or project, and now there's been a a lot of a lot of change, a lot of growth. Uh, definitely a lot, a lot of growth. I mean, you you yes far like the things that are like I said, going even going back to like what's on your bio, like the things that are on there. Like some of that wasn't even on there the last time we had this discussion. Like it's just been an amazing process to watch. It's been amazing to see your growth as a writer. And it's been amazing. I mean, you were already dope, but it's been amazing to see it just keep accelerating. Well, thank you. You know, and sometimes when I look back, when I'm telling you, when I hear that bio and I look back on my resume, I cry sometimes because it's like I never thought I would be <laughs> here. I really never thought I would be here at this point in my life or my career as an artist to say I've done this and that I'm doing this and I have room for more, give me more and I'm going to do more. I never thought I would be here. It is, I wanna tell you, I personally, so so for people who, again, in the audience who don't know, like, we're friends, we talk all the time, right? We have all kinds of, we talk all the time and you know, we talk about each other's careers and you know, just projects and bounce ideas off each other, all that kind of stuff, right? So, um, to watch the arc of like you having in the last since the last time you were on this show like step out and take off an artistic career has been absolutely phenomenal so that was one of the reasons why like i'm really glad you're back here and i cannot wait to see what these other hosts have in store for you question wise and and, and digging into like these various facets of things you're doing like writing to wellness is fantastic but this is just touching the surface so since we are at the the, the hour the magic the magic moment i am actually going to step back and like i said for the part that i've been waiting for because you've already talked to me it's their turn now <laughs> i am going to step out and next up i'm gonna give it to miss cayenne 
Awesome. Well, hello, Sunshine. How are you? I'm good. I'm happy to see you. I, I miss, miss you. you. I, miss well, I miss you, you too. I miss, I miss you, you too, my little chocolate rabbit. <laughs> I've been in some sun too. This light ain't doing me no justice. I've been in the sun today, laying out on the beach. So I act, I got a little extra extra melanin tonight. But it's definitely good to see you and and have you on the show and have an opportunity to, um, like 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 uh, like Danielle said, pick your brain a little bit. And there's so much. I'm saying to myself, oh my god, okay, let me let me be let me be targeted because there's so many different things. Uh, but you were talking and. Uh, about your next book, right? And I was intrigued, but I'm intrigued by that. I did a, uh, on Sundays, I do what I call, I do a live, it's called Sunday Coaching with Miss Cayenne. Mm -hmm. And I, I usually, am, it's, it's extemporaneous. I'm talking about whatever's been bubbling on, on the surface of my heart. And today's conversation was, was called Courageous Conversations. Um, I often talk about having them, whether you have to confront someone, whether you have to, um, apologize for something you've done wrong or have have an uncomfortable conversation. And I've talked about it in times past, but today I was like, for me, I realized I need to have more of those with myself, right? And so one of, one of the things I think about when I was listening to, I said, one of the things that comes to mind for me when I think of you is this ability to have courageous conversations, whether it's about yourself, whether it's two other people to to hold people accountable, whatever the case may be. But courageous conversations to me are those challenging ones. They, 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 they pull people on the carpet. They make you uncomfortable as a person initiating the conversation. You know it's going to cause uncomfortableness maybe on the other side. And most of us like to avoid that. You, however, have, in my opinion, right, this is my opinion, have, have I want to say mastered that ability, whether to cause others to have self-courageous conversations, writing to wellness. When I've been in your class, I've been forced to have a personal conversation. Um, I've seen you address things with others that may have been uncomfortable. How, how do you come to that place to have those uncomfortable conversations that most of us would avoid at all costs? How do you do that? Ooh, um, <laughs> that's a very, that's a loaded question. Um, you know, I suffer from depression and border and borderline personality disorder. And that's part of it. You know, that's part of the, that's part of the, the recipe for these courageous conversations that I have with myself. Okay. And then with the trauma from childhood and the, and full disclosure, the abuse from my childhood, you know, the harm that I was causing to myself that still spilled over into other people's lives was something that became very annoying. And even though I knew it was annoying, I couldn't, I don't want to say I couldn't, but at that time I wasn't ready to yeah. do anything about it, right? Yeah. Most powerful thing my very first psychiatrist said to me was, at age 23, the harder you run from yourself will be the harder you run into yourself. Mm. And I did not hear those words until I was 37. Did mm. not hear those words until I was 37. And yeah. at that time, I was, I can say I was absolutely at one of the most lowest points of my life. And I mm -hmm. hit it very well behind a smile and laughter and giggles, like, you know, the great pretending with depression always do. Yeah. And then I said, you know what, Chris, you have got to stop pretending. You have got to stop putting on this front. You have got to stop. You have to stop because you're not doing any justice for yourself. You're not mm. doing any justice for any blessing that's to come your way. You're not doing any justice for anything that's promised to you. And how dare you continue to tear yourself down and a part of someone else's misery that they try to pass on as yours. Mm. And once I had that conversation with myself, the boohoo crying started, of course. And, you know, it was like, it, it was that Viola Davis crying right. with a snack, you know, yeah. you know, and, you know, right little bubble, you know, sitting in the, in the corner 
with the tissue and, yeah. you know, the bottle and the bottle of wine and everything, you know, and then even with that, try to chase the answers with alcohol even was part of my life. Mm. And I said, that's not doing anything. That's nothing more but putting a Band-Aid over an open wound. And you're more than that. You're big yeah. than that. You're better than yeah. that. You deserve more than that. That's yeah. where these tough, courageous conversations come from, you know, because if I can go ahead and have these tough conversations with myself, if I can go ahead and turn around and look at that quiet person that would walk with his, literally would walk with his eyes to the floor and you would, would not meet anyone eye to eye because that's how my self-esteem was built. And I'm now able to look you in your eye or look myself, my own reflection in the mirror. I want other people to know that. Yeah. I want them to know that they are loved, are worthy yeah. of love, and they will be loved. And if no one has told them today, I love you. I need, yeah. I need them to know that. I don't care who you are. I don't care what role you are in my life or that you're not in my life. I need you to know that you are validated. That's yeah. where these conversations come from. Mm. So, so powerful. So powerful. I, this the, To me, there's an embodiment of, of, I talk a lot about awareness and uh, the, the nonprofit I have started was, the concept was this sense of awareness. When you are aware, like you said, you became aware, hey, this can't continue, Chris, <laughs> right? I, you can't do this, you know? And, and that, that, that piece right there, that awareness and that boldness to 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 act on that awareness and and that's so true i again i've, I've personally experienced uh writing to wellness not as not nearly as much as i want to and need to mondays can be a little tricky for me but nonetheless i've experienced it and that's exactly what it is an experience where i'm all of the things you just described i'm confronted um i'm forced to have a conversation there's a safety your transparency it, it it's a wonderful you know, ingredients for change and transformation, change and transformation. And you often, when I hear you talk about the the walk of transformation, it's not talk, it's it, you have to walk it out. Um, so with that said, um, and, and you hit on it a little bit just now, you're talking about, you know, previous self where you're maybe been cast down and looking down, and that's how the self-esteem was built at that time. Part of my segment of passion projects, I like to kind of go back you know we interview these great artists we see them in this light but then i'm like but where where was it always there i can look back and say i remember standing in the mirror with a towel on my head i thought i was diana i remember i think i made music videos before music videos was a thing in my mind you know what i'm saying i remember that space but i also remember having low self-esteem and not feeling i was worthy to be on the stage but you i'm curious i know there's a lot of history and a lot of trauma and things that were going on but even in that space where they where there breadcrumbs in your life that when you reflect on it you can say i knew i was going in the direction of being an activist or being an artist or being a mouthpiece whatever you see yourself as were there breadcrumbs along the way that showed if you reflect that say that about your life then now yes and the greatest breadcrumb, honestly, that was always present for me yeah. was when I actually made it a point to put foot to ground. Mm. That, okay. was, that was my breadcrumb because I was telling tomorrow yes. that I will be there. Mm -hmm. And I was, I, and I, that was something that <clears throat> I, I, didn't, I, didn't, and I didn't realize it until. I really started going through this healing journey. And every day that I put foot to ground was a protest for me to stand up to whatever it was that was designed to be in my way. Hmm. You know, and even with that, I had to realize, you know, a lot of people ask to be taken out of the storm that they're in. I had to learn not to be taken out of that storm. I had to know what I had to get from that storm. Mm. And when I got what I needed from that storm, what other storm is going to be given to me? Because yeah. let's face it, we're all going to face them. We can't escape them. They're going to be there. It, they're going to be there. I mean, down to the point where like, if your car doesn't start, if you run out of gas, it's, it's something that's going to make you say, oh my God, right? <laughs> Right, right. And it's just 
if I just knew and if I just held on to that and then right in the well, just going back to that, I always talk about your anchors. What is that one thing that you're going to hold on to to pull you through? And that was me putting my foot to ground, walking yeah. that storm, walking sometimes in the darkness. And even when you walk in the darkness, you have to know the darkness before you know light. So just doing that, that was the greatest approach has. That was the greatest breadcrumb, honestly. Those actually, those were my breadcrumbs. Got just it. that right there, that I had the ability to protest for myself before I even knew I had the ability to protest for myself. Wow. Jeez. That, oh, dude, I got goosebumps over here, for real. Goosebumps over here. I'm trying to gather myself together. Hold on for a second. <laughs> but putting foot to ground is on was a is a was a protest that that statement is kabooming in my head because there is a space right where i i you know all of our stories are different but i can definitely relate to being in a very dark place right i can i can relate to years of just feeling really really heavy and just kind of going through motions but what you just said, it just brought light even to those dark places in my mind because there was something in me, right? It says, I'm going to put foot to ground. Now, it's a struggle to do it, but I'm doing so. And with the hope, right, that that my tomorrow may look slightly different. And, and each time you do that, each time you do that, you, you're kind of widening the pinhole to light, right? To light because, and which obviously build you for this activist work. I love this term. I, my first introduction to the term community organizer was Barack Obama. Okay, I am a Barack Obama fan. Not so I don't want anybody to come through the comments on me. I'm a Barack Obama fan, particularly specifically because of his work as a community organizer, like the way he did the work. I, that's when I became familiar with that term, reading his books and understanding how he moved and navigated in the community. That term is in your bio. Talk to me about what does that mean to you to be a community organizer and what does that look like for you? Community organizing means for me, showing up for my community, even if by myself, when mm. someone, when others cannot. And it doesn't mean let's have this block party or do you know this great miraculous stuff. Now, now that's part of it. Don't get me wrong, it's part of it. Right. But for the most time, you know, just advocating for people when they don't have a voice or can't or don't know how to use their voice because your voice is a muscle, right? Yeah. Mm. And when I speak on anything, especially being a black queer, and that's it's very paramount for me, first of all, to be present with that because little black children who are going through or feeling that feeling of being, you know, of them being in love with someone of the same sex or same gender, and then being shunned by family, first and foremost, because of it, it's, it's horrible. And it's, and it's quite frankly, it's stupid, <laughs> you know, and just having those conversations and just doing all that work, like in April is a very big month for me right? It's National Child Abuse Prevention Month, and it's also National Poetry Month. I did a pinwheel garden that, were actually, that actually highlighted, you know, child abuse. And the pinwheels, for those of you who don't know, is a symbol of a child's happiness. And planting that pinwheel is actually standing in solidarity for all the children who have either passed away because of child abuse or who are being abused and the families who are affected by abuse. With that also, we attached haikus to these pinwheels. So, you know, to stand in solidarity. So, you know, putting those two together, that's the kind of community organize, organize, organizing that I love to do when I use my voice and when I use my platform. And sometimes I also like being present without being present. And I've inspired other people to do the same. Like I have helped spearhead so many other projects from behind the scenes mm. and on purpose. And it's just, it's just, it's just amazing how much you can be a community organizer without having to be always at the forefront, but you can still wow. have your fingerprint 
on that and still have enough power just to take your finger and to move mountains in, in, in directions, you know, playing Tetris with them, you know, making these mountains shape shift into what's supposed to be yeah. for that community and for those people. Yeah, That's what community organization for me looks like. Gotcha. Awesome. Awesome. I think that's powerful because for several reasons, but something you just said, you know, <clears throat> let me be careful how I say it. Many people, you know, they, 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 there's an end game for them, right? Yes, I'm about helping, but there's an end game and there's this, this thirst for spotlight. But you talked about something just there that, that speaks to me to the, to the depth and the passion of helping and being in, in, impactful in your community. Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't, it's not a necessity that, like you said, that I, you know, you are the spearhead or the name, but you know that when I put my hands to this, there is going to be change and I am doing what I'm supposed to do. Um, so for me, that was powerful because um, there's so many, you know, agendas out here, even, even in the helping and the altruistic uh, uh, industry, there's so many, you know, other intentions. And that may not be a bad thing, but I'm just saying I appreciate knowing that you have a heart and a passion uh, to make sure that this impact, whether, you know, whether my name is here, whether people seem to know or not know, you know, you know, you know what's going on. Um, so which kind of gives me a nice segue, my the passion. I talk about passion. We we have these two definitions that I like to play around with. Um, and I'm I'm being surfaced. I'm sure you could you know, I'm sure you can cut real deep on this on this word, but I am being served. So we have the basic enthusiasm, intense, uh, matter of fact, intense enthusiasm or feeling or that kind of thing. So the happiness, whether that's sexual, whether that's just um, emotion, high intense emotion, something we have passion for. Um, what would you say is your passion from that angle, the enthusiastic angle? Ah. Uh. I would say the greatest intense enthusiasm mm -hmm. is, is when someone tells me that I've inspired them. Yeah. And it always makes me blush. <laughs> and because <laughs> it, it, it does, it makes me blush and it makes me retreat into myself because yeah. and retreat in the fact of Oh my God! You know, I, I've I've done something with someone. Oh Lord, and it it reminds me to be humble, honestly, because of where I've come from. Now, my resume and my bio I know is absolutely extensive, but it is full of gratefulness and humility, and people who have pushed me to be great. And that, and when people tell me I inspire them, I tell them that just be grateful for everything that you're about to do. Yeah. Wow. Because you have not, you have just begun to scratch the surface of who you are. You have mm. just begun to scratch the surface of who you are. And when they tell me, oh, I want to be like you. Don't be like me. Be better than me. I want you to be inspired by the flame, but I want you to cause your own fire. Yeah. I want you to do those things. Be grateful and cause your own fires. And don't be afraid to look yourself in the eye and say, it is okay to fail, but watch me succeed tomorrow. Right, awesome. Do you feel like a, a sense of responsibility? When people say you inspire me, while it's humbling, and like you said, I can, I can relate to that cause you kind of like, oh, wow. But do you also feel a sense of, oh my gosh, you know, this may sound a little extra, but for the lack of better words, you know, oh my gosh, you know, someone else's life or or a portion of their life is kind of in my hands to a degree and again I'm, that may be a bit extra but you understand what i'm saying do you feel that responsibility sometimes yes, that weight? I, yes i do this is okay so this is funny um <laughs> i have a group of poets that i hold very near and dear to my heart and i mean I will slingshot my soul to the core of hell for them. <laughs> and always be going in. <laughs> <laughs> I will. And 
I hold them very near and everything yeah. that they share with me, everything that they're, they're, when they go through something, even when they don't feel like they're enough, mm. you know, I have to remind them you're talking to somebody who felt exactly the same way as you felt. Mm. And now that you're talking to me, I have to let you know that you're more than enough. Mm. You are everything than enough. Mm. And, you know, don't know the religion of anyone or the walk of anyone, but just know you are made in their image mm. and their image is absolutely magnificent. That means you're magnificent and you need to walk in your magnificence. Yeah. And it's to the point where now they call me mother. They call me their poetry mother. So I'm a whole mother in these streets. <laughs> <laughs> And oh gosh, yeah, and I can see. That. It's even funnier because of one of my one of my children <laughs> have um dubbed us House of Bernard, so mm. that's our poetry house, House of Bernard. House of Bernard. And wow. so those 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 babies are my treasures. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. And, and I think, you know, when you have that sense of awareness and responsibility, you know, you're going to be a good steward over them. So, uh, you know, you're not going to mishandle them in any fashion or form. So that's awesome. We got, uh, I think our next host wants to come on in there. No, yes, no. Let me say. <laughs> I'm almost done. I'm almost done. Okay, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I have, because cause cause for real, for real, you shoot i we can go all night as i you know because you such such richness here um i'm gonna say it before i forget i know the other host will say it but if you have questions uh that you would like for our guests to answer or respond to please go ahead and start putting them in the comments i love the, the comments are coming through here i can't even get to them fast enough but if you have questions um that you would like for our guests to respond to please you go ahead and start putting them in the comments so um so there's the in intense enthusiasm, passion, right? But Latin uh, origin of this word also speaks to suffering. Um, uh, it speaks to, matter of fact, I think the actual patois, if I'm not, if I'm saying it correctly, um, may not be, but it speaks to uh, suffering and pain, the passion of Christ uh, for the story of Christ, talking about, again, um, uh, the crucifixion and the things that this person uh, reportedly has gone through was called the passion or the suffering. And ultimately that, again, that for those who know that story um, speaks to what this person may have done for humanity, for mankind. So the passion, the intense pain and intense love were present in this story. There's another side to passion. Even this artistry, this walk of being an activist, I would imagine that there's some passion, AKA suffering, AKA angst, some push and pull as well. What would those things be for you, if at all? And then how do you reconcile them? <laughs> um, <He's> a... <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh yes, the angst, the push and pull, Jesus. Okay. There is a lot, to be honest with you, but I'm yeah. gonna choose one. Okay. Okay. Um, when people don't listen. Mm, yes. <laughs> when they, and I mean, they don't listen. In other words, you know, they have to be right. They have to be dominant. They have to be the majority. They have to be the alpha. You know, yeah. it's, it's okay for you to sometimes be that person who is being taught or being talked to. It's mm -hmm. okay. You don't always have to be a leader. Even the leader can be led and even the leader has a leader yes. so you don't always have to be that person but if you always have to be that person you have removed you so much of yourself and you're actually now leading by ego and mm. if you're leading by ego you aren't gonna have no room to listen if you have no room to listen you have no room to grow if you have no room to grow then you're stunted and you're nothing more than a weed in my garden and i have to get rid of you mm. wow wow that's a whole word and 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 a few more <laughs> that's a whole word. but 
but I think that process that you just kind of uh, described, it's very, there's a, there's a step-by-step, -step. like you, like you said, even a leader should have submits, submits him or herself or themselves to someone, something, even, even a good leader knows how to do that. Right. And secondarily, that's what, to me, I kind of, that's kind of how I define life. Like life is really about con the transformation process, like continuing to submit yourself to the growth, which means walking through the storm, right? It means having courageous conversations and being uncomfortable. It means looking in yourself in the mirror. It means sometimes sitting in the dark and sitting with yourself. This is what I was, this, is, this has been the theme all day as I was talking about it. So I get that. And then at some point you have to make a decision. This is not going to be productive for me and I have to let you go. That's, you know, and that's love. You know why it's love? Because it's a love for yourself, right? To say, I'm not going to <laughs> Right, exactly. So um, I, I love it. I love it. Here's at the end of my segment, I always ask a, a bunch of whimsical questions. Well, one of them is not so whimsical, but kind of is whimsical. And this is what I'll end my portion with for tonight. Um, if you had a billboard, right, you know, the big billboards that they have, whether it's a side of a building or an actual board, that would have a quote from you that would exist in the world well beyond you being on this earth it'll be your words that people will read for generations into generations into generations what would your billboard say um my favorite quote of all time um the one that right in the wilderness was built off of your pain may know you but it has no power over you mm. and there it is your pain may know you, but it has no power over you. Such awesome sauce that you just drip, right? You just drip in the awesome sauce, right? And I so appreciate learning from you today. This is a master class, y'all. Free! <laughs> so y'all make sure y'all uh, support. I'm going to exit this day so that my other co-host can pick the rest of your brain. <laughs> Hey, Chris. How are you? I'm good. I am so excited that you are back. And I'm glad that you, I, I really am excited that you are back for this interview. And I'm glad that we opened up ourselves to bring people back, um, especially since we've changed platforms. Um, my first question to you was, I believe it was just within the last two years, you made the decision to uh, leave a regular day job to pursue being a poet artist full time. What, th this is actually a two part question. The first part of the question is, what made you decide that now was the time? And then part two of the question is, did you take any steps to prepare yourself? Because we can make these decisions to be a full time artist, but we still got to eat. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So one day, April 15th, 2021, <laughs> I woke up and minded my good black business and sat on the side of my bed and just looked out my window and said to myself, actually, I said it out loud, I'm so tired. I am tired and tired of the sense of sitting behind the desk of someone else's dream while putting mine on the back burner. Mm -hmm. And I even went through the motion, Sherry, of preparing myself to go to work. Um, and I was moving extra slow that morning and took my shower, had my coffee. I even skipped listening to my music because I normally listen to music while doing all that. I couldn't even do that because I was just so fixated on being tired. Mm -hmm. And I left, got the car. And this story, it gets funny now because I'm in my car, put my sunglasses on, and anyone who knows me knows I love Janet Jackson. So I, I try to get my spirits up. And I had Janet Jackson's Velvet Rope album playing. And as I'm going across the Woodrow Wilson Bridge, I felt these little prickles on the back of my neck. And I swear it was my ancestors telling me, you need to listen to yourself. If you're tired, do something about it. And as I'm continuously driving across the bridge, the prickles just got more intense and they became more, more intense as I got closer to my exit. And then I, when I hit the exit, I saw the exit to Baltimore and I was like, you can always turn around. 
And the prickles literally at that point just grabbed the back of my neck. And oh, I took the exit from Baltimore, came right back across the bridge, back to Maryland. And mm -hmm. the prickles just let go. And as I'm talking to myself, I call my friend, a friend of mine, and I say, hey, you think I should quit my job? I said, because this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm going through. And they said, you're really asking me, should you quit your job? Because they had just quit their job to pursue their dream. Oh, and wow. they are, by the way, they are doing absolutely wonderful. They are now making almost in the high six figures by themselves doing what they're doing. And I am absolutely proud of that. And I was like, you know what? You're right. You're the wrong person to ask because you're going to tell me just go ahead and do it. So I hung up on them. <laughs> and as I'm going across this bridge, I turn up the radio to more Janet Jackson, adjusted my sunglasses and adjusted myself in the seat. And I just started thinking, say, well, maybe I should turn back around and go into work. And as soon as I had that thought, Sherry, no lie, them damn prickles came back and grabbed me in the back of my neck. I said, OK, so this is a good sign that I should not go into work. And I just kept, I just went home. I sent an email. I quit through email for this job. Mm. And I had no regrets. And this is a job of a practice manager for 15 years in dentistry. And I happily walked away from it. Had mm. no backup plan at all. There was no plan in place of what I was going to do, of who I was going to do it with, or any of that. And not even doing it for myself, right? On my own as an entrepreneur, you know, whatever. And it was no plan in place. So I autom automatically went into panic mode and I started to apply for jobs back in dentistry. And because it was, it's all I knew. And as I'm looking for these jobs, those prickles came back. And I was like, okay, I'll stop. So I sent a text message to, no, I, I received a text message from the center director of Creative Suitland at the time that this happened. And he was asking me to do something. I can't remember what it was. And I said, okay, that's not a problem. I said, oh, and by the way, I'm no longer employed. So if you know anyone who's looking for a job, let me know. Working with them anyway with doing writing wellness, I've already had formed a relationship with them. And I was already, and I have already been working with them for a year anyway as one of their um, artist partners and online teaching artists. So I was automatically right then and then before the job description, actually before the job position even went onto onto Indeed, they sent me the job description for the poetry coordinator. Oh wow! And I was like. And I almost did not apply for it because I honestly did not think I was good enough for the position. Mm -hmm. And something just told me just to do it anyway. And I did it and had my interview two days later. Then I had another interview with the executive director, the program, the assistant program director, and with the center director. And that was at the end of April, the beginning of the end of April, beginning of May is when I got a phone call letting me know that I got the position. And the rest has been history. The doors that have been open, the doors I have walked through, the people who I have met, the embracement I have received from other artists just has been absolutely overwhelming. And even with the 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 added on bonuses, the accolades that have been added on to it because of this decision has been just like it has been a tearjerker. Sometimes I do sit down and I just like, I'm, I, I cry sometimes, happy tears, of course, because right. like, had I not listened to the prickles, <laughs> you know, I would not be doing what I'm doing. Like I've been recognized by the queen and the princess of Sweden for my advocacy work in child abuse prevention, mm. you know, and I have set on um, panels with notable poets. I have done work with councilmen and councilwomen, the, the mayor of District Heights and the former mayor of District Heights. I have done work with these people. And I have, I, I'm just, I'm amazed by what I've been able to do, even putting C. Thomas works into full throttle now with right. programs and the teaching artistry, all of that, even artist development, all of that. It has been so overwhelming yet amazing and wow. i do not regret that decision at all 
Oh, I know. But being in your circle, I know that you don't regret it. But it was like I, I think for some for some people, there would be a moment of, OK, rent is going to be due in a couple of weeks. I got to make sure that, you know, everything's covered before I roll out. Um, I had another question before I got into my from behind the microphone questions. It is. Wow. It left. It'll come back. I decided that I don't fight my brain. I don't fight my brain anymore, y'all. If it left, it left. It'll come back if it's meant to be. My first question to you is, especially since you are a former host. Oh, wait a minute. Before I get into my regular from behind the microphone questions, um, some history that most would not know is that um, this started as a blog post on my website I used to do for my feature artists. Oh, probably about seven, eight years ago. And I want to let y'all know that C. Thomas was one of the people that was reading the original articles and was one of the people, actually the first person to tell me, actually, Sherry, you need to do this as a live interview thing. So <laughs> it is really fun to sit here with you right now <laughs> in this moment to give you some of these questions from, from behind the microphone as a live interview thing. <laughs> I forgot all about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I forgot all about that. Mm -hmm. Yes, this was a blog. And I mm -hmm. remember, and I would really, really, really take the time to read them. Mm -hmm. And I must say, Sherry, I thank you for what you've done with that too, because you took the time to, and you building yourself. And I know this is, you're not on the spot as me, but um, you took the time to highlight a lot of people when you did not have to and you were still building and branding and some people did not take you serious some people just mm -hmm. <clears throat> just thought you was going to be like a one hit overnight wonder right look at her now everybody <laughs> look at her now, okay so it's been it's been, are, it's been wow you have you have your roses behind you and i mm -hmm. want to give you more roses because oh, sometimes you. you have to give you yourself your roses and I'm very, I'm very proud of you, Sherry. And I tell you this all the time, and I say this all the time we speak, but I really am proud of you. Thank you, Chris. I really appreciate that. I really do. It's, it's been a road. Last several years have been a road. So my first question to you, as a former host, open mic host, we often get people that will come up to us at the end of the night and say, I don't know that I could ever do that because I have, you know, my first time on stage. I don't know that I could ever do that. So I always ask, tell the story of the first time you performed a poem on stage, how you felt about it, how long ago it was. <laughs> okay, so mm -hmm. back in 2014, mm -hmm. no, 2004, I lied, 2004, because I was 24 at the time. Um, there was an art gallery in Clinton, Maryland called Studio 2001 Art Gallery. Mm -hmm. First time ever going to an open mic. Been writing poetry my entire life almost. <clears throat> Forgive me. It's okay. Um, since age 13. And I used to read my poems to one of my siblings. And I'd say that when they took me to this open mic, it was because they got tired of me reading to them. <laughs> so <laughs> they took me to who they were like, no, 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 go to your people, please go to your people. Here are your people. Right, sit here are your people. And and you know, sit there and be. I show up and you no, know, we show up and you know what she she was she was pretty much dressed. I had on a pair of white tennis mm -hmm. shoes, blue jeans. And a white t-shirt you know typical attire mm -hmm. and when we pull up i see all these dashikis these head wraps these african print dresses i'm like oh my god i am not a poet oh my god i am not a poet and i walk in and everyone's smelling like you know frankincense and mirror and jasmine and lavender i'm like oh my god i just have on speed stick oh my god i am not <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and so Mm -hmm. I walk in, mm -hmm. the list, it was, I mean, when I, it had to be about 60 
people there because it was and because the art gallery it was an art gallery it's kind of like a, a small a good size art gallery but it wasn't big enough to hold like a lot of people but yeah. it had to be about a good 60 70 people on the inside and it had to, and maybe 20 people on the outside and i was there i put my name on the first person to sign up on the list was me <laughs> oh no and never been to an open mic and i wasn't thinking you know you sign your name up first you're gonna go first you know i wasn't thinking that i just know hear my name whatever whatever so and i and then i used to go by the name moods and because i also thought you had to have a name to be deep and everything but um <laughs> it was so much you know love jones messed up a lot of stuff but um <laughs> i'm gonna get into names because we bone each other a minute so we're gonna yeah, ask I, this I, question I went through them i went through them and um <laughs> and so artists so the host calls my name and i'm like oh no she really did call me first so i go up there and i think the first poem I ever read out loud, it was, I, I don't want to say it, but nonetheless, um, I, it was it was on paper because I didn't memorize any of my poetry back then. Mm -hmm. And it was on paper. And when I was up there, this is me in the microphone. <laughs> that was me in the microphone. And I mind you, and the paper is going, like you mm -hmm. can see, mind you, white t-shirt, it looked like I had an oasis under my underarms. Oh no! Was so, <laughs> so on the spot, I was like, "Oh my god!" And I read the poem like I was reading to myself, and I like I did. I tried to like tune everybody out. So if people were clapping and snapping, I did not hear it because I was like, "I just want to get this over with." And blah blah blah, I go sit down. So when I finished the poem, I just walked off. Like, I really just like, okay, I got to go. The host came back and grabbed me and to pull me back up. I'm like, I don't want to read no more. Stop. I, that's what I thought that she was doing. Mm -hmm. And she's like, you need to take this in. They, they were really clapping for you. And I looked out into the audience. And so then they started clapping again. Like, it was, and it was actually a standing ovation. I mean, it was the very first time I ever received a standing ovation for anything that I wrote. And shared with a general public. This is my first time at an open mic. <clears throat> and that was the scariest time of my life. The oh, scariest. I, I appreciate you saying that. I had a I had I had just had a poet at Bus Boys and Poets a couple of weeks ago, and this was their first time as well. And I and I told them, I said, look, we all do this. We all have the first time. We get to be professional later. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you currently have chosen not to use a stage name. Correct. And now that you've brought it up, now for those that don't know, when uh, Chris and I met, they were Poetry Child. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I still love that name. So instead of just asking why did you choose to go with your with your government name, I'm going to ask now what are some of the other names you went by? <laughs> um, <laughs> I went by moods. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's so horrible and it's so embarrassing. Um. Butter, B U T T A. <laughs> um, oh my God, this is this is this is embarrassing. Um, then it was Poetry Child, mm -hmm. and then after Poetry Child, I was like, no, it's time to put all that mm -hmm. to rest. Okay. And that's when I started looking at me and what I was doing, and I said, you know what? People don't want to know Poetry Child; they want to know who Chris is. Let mm -hmm. me give them, and let me give them C. Thomas. You know, I wanted to still give them something, something that was mm -hmm. still artist, but also me at the same time. And I was like, and there's nothing wrong with my name. And then another poet found out my middle name, mm -hmm. and because it's it's really a cute middle name, y'all. And I had then recently added Alexandria Bernard. So I now go by C. Alexandria Bernard Thomas. Okay. Because it, it commands power as far as I'm concerned. I love it. So we, 
Uh, Dr. Dupas came on one day and asked someone this question, and I, I, I respectfully ask everyone else, what is the name of the poem or what is the prompt of the poem you haven't written yet? Ooh, and you know what's funny? Because I'm actually in the process of trying to write that poem now, and it is so, so hard for me to write this poem. And it's about my brother who passed away when I was 14. Mm. And I have the title of the poem. I know how I want to, I, I have the title of the poem and I know how I want to write it, but it's just getting to that point of writing it. I get that. I get that. Who is your favorite writer? This could be a songwriter, this could be a poet, an author, anyone you consider a writer. I have two. Go right ahead. Um, and I'm gonna tell you why. Mm -hmm. First, no, I actually have four. I'm gonna tell you all four. Go ahead. First one is Duke the Root. Yes. Ooh. And it's really because he is a very personal close friend of mine. And his mind matches his feelings. Mm. And he doesn't mince how he feel or what he's feeling. And he makes no apologies for it. And the way he puts words together and how he's able to shape his feelings into letters and into words is absolutely exquisite. And when he does it and how he does it, it's just, you can't help, oh, I, well, you can't help but to say, I have to push my pen a little bit harder. Agreed, agreed. <laughs> the second one <clears throat> would be Misfit. Um, Misfit, the name says it all. He is a very, he's a monster, like very quiet in nature. Mm -hmm. But when you put him in front of a mic or even on a stage, it's over. The whole stage belongs to him. He leaves no crumbs. The stage is devoured. And okay. he writes also from a very ferocious place. Mm -hmm. And he gets lost in the moment. It's like he, he almost transcends when he's performing. And I like that. Like I see a, a very bright blue fire when he performs. Third writer would be Carmen Newhouse. And she is just, Carlin is, Carlin is just that is that punch to the gut that everyone needs because she really, really makes you, mm -hmm. she makes you look at the world and life in such a way that you can't help but to mm -hmm. look at yourself and, and your role that you may have played. <laughs> Agreed. And, you know, you, and then last but never least is Naya. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I have tried, but there is nothing this woman cannot write. Agreed. And if there is, she has not told me, <laughs> but... You ain't figured it out yet. <laughs> if there is, she has not told me, but she... <laughs> pours her entire everything. You know, when grandma used to cook in the kitchen and, you know, it'd be like, you know, grandma put her foot in this and everything. Mm -hmm. That's Naya with her poems. <clears throat> but the four of them together, you know, they are, as far as I'm concerned, the four corners of the earth when it comes to poetry. They are the four corners of earth when it comes to poetry. I because love it. They're young they're fiery, they're earthy, they're wind, they're water, they're all of that. <clears throat> and when they perform, you can't help but to be mesmerized. Agreed, agreed. And I just want everyone can see that Carlin is actually in the chat. So, <laughs> so my last question, I'm gonna skip over several, but I'm gonna ask my last question, which is this, if heaven exists, and I've taken this directly from 
inside the actor's studio. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? <laughs> um, if heaven exists, what would I like God to say when I arrive at the pearly gates? You know, you almost ain't make it. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that's, but that's true. Mm -hmm. If you knew me back then, you would understand why I, I said that. <laughs> I, I, you know what? I completely get it. I completely get it. So thank you, Chris. You know I love you. You know I love you from the bottom of my heart, from the corner of my soul. But now I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our fourth host, Kaniki. Oh, hello, hello, hello. I look, real, I look real light skin. Hold on. I don't, need, I don't need to look at light skin. I have I have no sense. I know. I look real light skin. skin but it's okay. I look light skin. Did, did, did. Okay. I love you. I love you too, Muffin you, Pie. How are you? I am so fantastical. I'm so glad that you are here, here with us and here in the present with us, here, here in the flesh. I'm so glad that you are here. Um, from poetry's child to poetry's mother. <laughs> you better quote that. I'm gonna need that to be quoted on something I'm saying, I'm saying. So I'm supposed to talk about some platforms. What I will say is when I met you, like following you on social media, you are a social media uh, promotion genius, okay? You're gonna make the people feel like, I felt like I was, you know, when I featured for you, I was like, this is the most amazing thing. You have told everybody in the world how amazing I'm about to be. You know what I'm saying? It's all about the promotions, right? And I know like sometimes for an artist, you can just be an artist. So the question is, what made you decide to make the platform part? Because you could just be like an artist, right? But then somebody got to make some platforms. What decided, what made you decide to be on the platform? I wanted <clears throat> artists like myself, because when I, I stopped writing at a certain point in my life. And then when I started, when I began writing and performing again, that's when busboys and poets came into the picture for me. And that was so long ago. And I think that was around like 2012 when I discovered Hyattsville because I knew about 14th and V, but I, um, then Hyattsville came into existence. And I um, went there and, was and I didn't get a chance to perform that night that I went and it was on eBaby's night. Mm -hmm. And good night. It was a very packed night <laughs> and to the point you remember because you know people had to sit on the stage sometimes for his night mm -hmm. that's how that's how packed it was right and i was like i want to do this and i want to do this because not just for the thrill and excitement of being in front of a mic but for the person who deserved to be heard Mm -hmm. and who needed to be heard and then sometimes not even just in that in center but just to get what is on their chest off and with me being a black gay poet it was i wasn't always received and mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so i was like you know what it's not gonna stop me from doing what i'm doing but it may stop the next black gay poet from doing right. what they want to do and i don't want that for anybody and then not just for that black gay poet but for anyone across the board period right. so i had to create something and that's when mic check came into existence and mic check where artists check reality at the mic mm -hmm. and it was like just just hearing those artists that just came out of literally out of the nooks and crannies, the hole in the walls, and just blew me the hell away. And then when I had people reaching out to me to feature, I was like, "Oh my god, I'm 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 doing something." And uh -huh. <laughs> and it was that was a very magnificent feeling there. Like I had notable notable poets who I admired saying, hey, you have a spot that I can feature at? You know, I want to feature here. You no, know, I heard about your open mic. I want to come do this. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God, really? Sure, come on down. I, I got some time for you. And 
that's how me creating my platform came to exist. I just wanted mm -hmm. a space for people to breathe and to be and to exist and to know that they are valid. Mm -hmm. You definitely created that and made everybody feel like a superstar. You know what I'm saying? It, it, it was it was an amazing platform. And even online, when you did it online during the pandemic, it was just as, as amazing when you pivoted to the to the online platform. Oh, yeah, that was needed. I don't want to lose you. Come on. OK, I'm like, come on now. We, we, we got to keep you. We got to keep you. So what made you pivot from from using a stage name to your whole name? You're going to get this whole name in here, the whole name. What made me pivot was I, for me, and this is just for me, I got tired of playing around with my power. You know, I stopped running from me. And, you know, all of my friends tell me that, you know, we know you're humble and we know you're this, but it's okay for you to brag. It's okay for you to be cocky with yourself because you've done a lot. And I don't ever hear you talking about it. I don't even hear you saying who you really are. And I was like, mm -hmm. you know what? Let's start with something slight. Let's do the name change. And mm -hmm. that's how the government came to be the actual and present name. Mm -hmm. and that's why I started. I using love it. Now listen. Now, uh, C. Thomas and I are, are friends, and we have had many of conversations on doing work hours, right? So this is one person that, if the phone rings, I don't send the voicemail, right? I'm gonna answer the phone. I'll be like, "You all right?" Because I'm at work. Yeah. All right. But I can hear. I can see the the change in you from moving to from that nine to five that you had to now right to be able to step out on faith and do that so i want to know was there a plan did you just i know you said you woke up in the morning and said i'm tired like did you have a financial plan um what would you have done differently or did you do it right to leave because everybody want to be a full-time artist but nobody want to be starving artists nobody want to be no starving artists you know honestly Kaniki, i i i feel i'm still figuring everything out but I'm doing good with what I'm doing. <clears throat> and there was no plan. There was no plan at all in place. There was no plan. I have always been the person to just do, and I will figure it out as I'm going along. I have always been that person. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but I just keep, I just go. There is never, I have never had a plan in place for anything. Some things, yes, because some things do require a plan or thought. But outside of that, with something like something life changing and major, I never have a plan because for me, the plans have always gotten in my way. Or it's been the plan mm. of someone, or it's been the plan of someone else that was pushed on me to follow. So I'm like, no, I'm just going to do it my way. And if my way requires no plan, then that's just what it's going to be my way. Mm -hmm. And so there, there was no, there was no plan. There was a cup of coffee, and that was it. But there was no plan. No, wow. What I, what I can say about C. Thomas, even though we are friends, right? Anytime there is a an opportunity for some type of featured performance or something, I'm going to be approached professionally. And somehow, you need to tell these poets how to get their professional poetry up, right? Because I'm going to get an email saying I'm available for, for hire and here's my press kits, here's all my photos, here's all my stuff. Can you can you, can you you feature me? And I was talking to another young lady, I won't say her name, but she was um, kind of not complaining, but concerned that people weren't featuring her, right? So I said, have you asked anybody to feature you? And she thought that it was in poor taste to ask for a feature. What's your feelings on that? Should you be asked to feature? Should you ask people to feature you? Or is, is, it, is, it, is it in poor taste? Is it a rookie move, right? I don't You're think a professional poet now. We still talking. We, you still sending emails to people. What, what yeah. do you, what, how do you feel about that? It's not in poor taste. And I've always felt it has never been in poor taste. And I don't care what level you're on. It's just like, say, for instance, if any business merger in corporate America goes through, it's another corporation that is notable approaching that corporation to acquire something. Correct. Mm -hmm. Why should we be any different? 
Why should we wait for the deal to come to us when we can go to the deal? If I know I have time and I want to do something and hey, I want to feature. Do you have any openings? I would love to be on your stage. Here's my press kit. Here's a video. Here's a letter of recommendation. I'm available this time. This is what I do. This, 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 this. I would love to welcome the opportunity to talk to you to see how we can both benefit from one another. Mm-hmm. There's nothing wrong with approaching someone to feature. It's nothing wrong with it, honestly, because honestly, if you think about it, it's humility, number one. It removes ego, number two. And then mm-hmm. three, for the full-time artist, we have to apply for those jobs, right? So you have to put yourself out there. And it's okay. If they come to you and say, hey, we want to feature you, that's one thing. But don't even sit with that. Don't be afraid or don't be conceited and cocky enough to be mm-hmm. like, nah, I ain't gonna go look, I ain't gonna ask nobody to feature. You, right. you, you know who I am. You know what? Yes, I know who you are. That's probably why you're not on my stage, because mm-hmm. I know who you are. So mm-hmm. It's not an issue. Remove yourself and stop. Take yourself off that pedestal because let's be clear. Some of these poets, and I'm gonna say this and probably you know get some back get some backlash for it. Some of these poets that put themselves on pedestals are mm. afraid of heights and have nosebleeds. Take mm, yourself. Mm, 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 mm. Right. I will say the the approach. Like if you are, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't know what the word is. If you are a, a bashful about asking people to feature, I will say the approach from C. Thomas is like, I'm going to email all the people I'm assuming, you know, that I know who hosts venues and say it and not asking for a feature, but saying I'm available to feature. Right. So that's, that's a different thing. So it, it using, you know, of course, like we're friends. So, you know, C. Thomas can text me and say, Hey, you got an open issue. I, I'm, I'm looking for a feature. Right. So that's fine. But I'm going to get that professional email with all the information that I need and saying, Hey, Y'all, I'm available for workshops. I'm available to facilitate. I'm available for feature. I'm available for host, right? And then so you know that I'm available, not saying can you, but if you need somebody, I'm available for hire. So that's a different approach that I can say. And it's it's always been, you know, professionalism. And that's one thing that I appreciate with business has always been business. And sometimes, you know, poetry, poet, this poetry business, people don't be about their poetry business. They be about them poems. But they're not about them poetry, that poetry business. At all. Yeah, not at all. Not at all. And it's it's it's, it's interesting. Um, so I'm supposed to ask you questions about the platforms, right? I gotta be on the platforms. Okay. Do you ever are you ever triggered or tired? Like I know I asked um I asked um one of um another one of my um guests about having a platform that's outside of like you having a platform, okay. Of course you're you're facilitating workshops, cool. You are uh, presenting events, cool. But then you have an entire platform for children, right? And this is something that is dear and dear to you. We've already talked about that. Do you get tired? Like, are you like, I don't want to talk about this because I have to tell my story, right? Is it triggering to continue to tell your story to relate to these children to save these babies? Do you ever get tired? Like, you don't want to do it. You don't want to do that every time to be honest and because again as i stated before i never know what's going to surface or what's going to resurface and trying to and then try and then sometimes like i was i I gave a speech at a school and during that speech something within my speech something a memory surfaced a a repressed memory surfaced Mm -hmm. and literally what i'm while i'm giving the speech talking to the audience and i had to sit there and actually grip the podium for something for me to focus on so i can still continue to deliver the speech and not crash in front of all of them Mm -hmm. and because i i personally never know what's going to what's going to happen what's going to come to the forefront or nothing i never know so wow. <clears throat> any type of for any any form of trauma you never know what's going to happen or what's going to ha- it, it can happen like i said on stage afterwards during or before it's very very taxing but yes to answer your question i do get tired mm-hmm. because it's it's exhausting. I don't regret doing any of the work, and I would never regret doing the work. But it can be very tiring. 
Mm-hmm. To, the, to, to um, like sometimes I actually just want to, sh- like I said, shut down, lay in the dark, and just listen to sounds mm-hmm. that would just actually help me bring me back down or coast me back down. Right, right. I ask that because you know, if somebody that's listening right now, or somebody that's gonna watch the the uh, the playback, right, and it's something that you know uh, the universe or, or God is gonna use that person for, because you know, even for you, any person, you're listening to the person who has been through the thing, right? And they're on the other side of the thing. You, I can't, I can't listen to you. You don't know what I'm talking about. You haven't been through something, right? So sometimes, you know, we are used for that. And I know that some people who have a platform that they need to um, create, but don't want to talk about this thing, right? I don't want to talk about this thing and, and, and how to cope with this. So I'm saying, get you a therapist and get you a plan. That's what I'm saying. That's that's all I got to say about that. And you know what? And I still, to this day, I do have a therapist spe- uh, specifically because of the type of work that I do. Um, right. I have to have a therapist. And because dealing with writing the wellness, the talks, the classes that I teach, because all the classes that I teach are all trauma informed and trauma based. Mm-hmm. And then performing and then telling my stories like that cycle over and over. I have to have something outside of the stage right. to help keep me grounded. Right. That's that's a word in itself right there. That's a word. You have to have something outside of the stage to, to help you be grounded. And I mean that's 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 the word. It really, really is. It is. So listen, <clears throat> let me ask you because you know I'll be on here all night. You know I'll be talking. Listen, you know when you answer the phone, you're gonna have to have some time. Like, don't answer the phone. You better say you're gonna call me back because you know you got I'll be talking. So you know you gotta have some time to be talking to me. <laughs> so my mama, who I know is listening because I called her, she is the person who I call whenever something happens, right? From child, let me tell you what this child got on on the corner to child. I done got this grant money, right? So my mama is the first person that I call. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to shout out your people. Who are your people? Oh, okay. Serena, Carlin, Naya, Misfit, Duke, you, Sherry, Gigi, um, Miss Cayenne, cre- everybody at Creative Suitland, um, Anna, Kalila, Butterfly Free, I'm sorry. Um, oh, my God, the list goes on. Oh, so many people. Who am I forgetting? So it's so good to have people. Oh my God, who I'm forgetting some people. Um, all the entire writing the wellness family. <clears throat> um, myself, you know. <laughs> that's how about to yourself? How far to yourself? That's yes, what I'm talking about. That's that's who I'm going to shout out. What are you doing today, right now, doing these days? What are you doing doing these days that your older self is going to thank you for? being present for myself and Yay. actually and actually learning that no is a not a complete sentence but the best complete sentence that's what i'm saying that's what i'm saying the best complete sentence that's what i'm talking about that's what the i'm talking about best complete sentence yes you know we don't we don't take it we don't take time to uh congratulate ourselves like you say to listen to your bio is to bring you to tears. Sometimes, you know, uh, you know, uh, Shelly Bell, that y'all know her by, she goes by Omi now. She was telling me all the stuff that I did. I was like, I oh, you're right, I did that. I didn't even know I did that, right? So sometimes, like, as an artist, you don't take time to congratulate yourself, right? You don't take time to, you're going from one accomplishment to the next, from one thing to the next. Like, you're not taking a pause to say, hey, I did this. Hey, I got an award for this. Hey, you know what I'm saying? You're not... You're not taking that time to do that. So it is, uh, I'm sure those tears are, are gratitude tears, right? They um, are. Some of those things that were, were planned, like you realize, oh, that's why I had to go through this thing, right, to get to the next thing. Even though you're saying, I don't have a specific plan for certain things. Oh, but you do. You do. Like you, you're planning, like you, I'm going to plan, I'm going to quit this job. You know what I'm saying? I planned, I, I just planned it today. But I'm gonna plan. I'm gonna get some work from somewhere else, right? I might have just planned it today. So you do. You have a plan, and you are uh, an amazing person, amazing human being, very compassionate, um, very, um, very particular, um, very purposeful, and a really, really good friend. And I and I really do 
thank you for that. Good, a very good listener, and I really do thank you for that. And honest on stage, you are the person that you. I will say the person that you see on stage, you are that person off stage, and you don't get that a lot. You do not get that a lot. So that means a lot. Thank you. I just had to go ahead and shout you out and say thank you very much for that, because I'll keep talking and people are gonna be mad. So I'm 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 not let me see what time it is. I, I'm not gonna ask any more questions. I'm not gonna do it. I'm already got the five minute thing, and I ain't about to say nothing else. I, I I'm not gonna say nothing else. I'm just gonna hold. I'm gonna hold. Welcome. Hello, 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 hello. Now. I'm going to jump in here real quick because I said I'm allowing my brain right now to do whatever it is it feels like doing. And I was going to get that question back. The question came back. So in everything that we've talked about with you becoming an artpreneur this year, what are you doing to practice self-care, to take care of yourself? Because this can be. I like to watch now something I'm actually putting into practice now. Mm -hmm. um watching mindless stupid stuff on netflix and drinking valerian root tea and <laughs> laying in the bed with my cat that is my self-care <laughs> and like it, it just removes me from all of that madness <laughs> and mm -hmm. what i'm watching currently right now on netflix is called it's a cartoon called disenchantment and it's from the makers of the simpsons and futurama it is hilarious and have you watched Q wait a minute, have you watched Q Force yet? I have not. Put it on the list. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I know our, our silent <laughs> member, as we call him, our secret male member will be coming in shortly. But um, and that there he goes. Again, if you have a question for C Thomas, feel free to drop it in the chat. We will go ahead and ask it. I will let analysis ask their own question. Oh, look, it's the honorary ally. God. It's honorary. That's right. Honorary analyzer, you know, good, good, uh, you know, token male. I get to hang out with these dynamic sisters and what have you. I actually, I got caught on guard because I was waiting for the, for the second piece, for the back end piece, but, but uh, I'll go ahead and slide in because you know, I love you. Still want that. Mm -hmm. that that's right. That's right. Um, you know, always dynamic. And anytime I get a chance to hear you, uh, it's a reaffirmation of the human spirit uh, in terms of who you are uh, and what you've come through and what you have done, uh, as you've hinted at in this particular conversation, what you have done with trauma instead of just letting it eat at you and burn you down. Uh, you've taken that uh, and utilized it for your own purposes. What if I can bastardize scripture, what assholes meant for evil, you have used for good. Um, and I appreciate you for that and 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 for your spirit. Um, interestingly enough, right before this session this evening, I just went to hear uh, our dynamic fam, Ephraim, Nehemiah, uh, and their one, uh, one person show called Intersectionality where he explores a lot of that. And, and I often think of you in terms of the way you're using your art to uh, express the ideas of intersectionality and, and breaking down these false silos of oppression because we have to navigate any number of them and you navigate any number of, uh, of those forms of fighting back against societal oppression. My question that I often ask folk uh, on keep the mic on uh, of, a, of a particular faith context and have kind of a, a faith framework uh, to a degree in their work. Do you find that you get opportunities uh, for performance from faith communities, from congregations, uh, from regional adjudicatory bodies, from uh, uh, faith related events? opportunities generally and especially in terms of paid gigs uh because because i want to know if 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 you as artists for all of this that needs to be in those those contexts and they need it yesterday uh it's something that i wonder if you are, are being reached out to if you have a chance to connect something i ask about my own artistry and other people's do you have those opportunities i do good i do 
And it used to shock me at first, but then I was like, you know, you like me, so okay, you're gonna get it. And you know who I am because clearly you have reached out to me and or you I was referred to you because I, I don't ever ask to perform at faith-based uh, institutions at all. I'm all I've literally been asked by everyone I've been approached by that I have been asked. And <clears throat> they know my background, they know what I stand for, they know what I represent. And I have been very fortunate to not get any backlash for me going into the church, especially the church, and actually perform one of my famous poems, No Apologies, No Regrets. Mm -hmm. And right, right, Kaniki, exactly. And um, <laughs> performing that and performing that poem there and in a church, and I do it on purpose because I want them to know, and it's not because of my my stance with religion or with Christianity or with any of that. It's I want them to understand that you condemning this one body is taking light off of what's actually going on within this entire world with you as a church body. And if you really want to be technical, church, um, homosexuality was not added into the Bible actually was forcefully added into the Bible in February of 1946. And it was actually pedophilia. But I can't remember the two Latin terms that were actually in the Bible, but they actually meant perversion. And they actually associated homosexuality with that. <clears throat> but it actually translated to be pedophilia. Thou shalt not lay with a child. And that's how that came to exist. And that's what I like to point out to a lot of these theologists, because some of them honestly don't know because it wasn't taught or they just chose to ignore it because of what of how they were brought up because they want to follow in their family's footsteps. Yeah. And that's why I purposely perform no apologies, no regrets on purpose. And, it, and it's needed. And that's why I say, you know, faith communities need your poetry yesterday. Uh, and and so I'm glad that. Uh, that there's a relationship with some of them. Some of them, we know, not not nearly enough, but some of them, you know. Absolutely. We do have a question from the uh, audience, from Asha Watson, former guest. Everyone can go back and look for their interview. Asha asks, okay, wait a minute, it disappeared. Hey, love. Okay, my computer just did the most. I'm, I've always admired your courage and your transparency. What advice do you have for artists that struggle with being vulnerable on stage? The advice, the best advice I can give you for that, and that's a very good question, and something for me that worked, you have to be ready. You have to be ready to be vulnerable because, you know, it sounds good and it looks good on stage, but then can you handle with the preparation of what that vulnerability is going to do to you while before you perform that poem or that piece on stage you know um can you handle the actual trauma that may be triggered after that vulnerability or even during that vulnerability on stage are you going to be able to even not just with you but with someone in the audience are you going to be able to to harness that and you have to be at a certain point in your healing to be that vulnerable or even vulnerable on stage. Um, if you do it with the handshake, I wanna know that formula, I really do. But I really encourage that you be at a certain space in your life and in your healing that you can be vulnerable like that on stage because you can be a complete savage with all your other poetry. But when it comes to that, that poem, that you know that sometimes tears you apart to share don't do it case in point um my poem before my about my mother she it took me years to write that poem and it took an additional few years for me to perform that poem because i was not ready to face that at all i couldn't i could not handle that mm. so you have to be ready all right Team, anyone? Bringing it. Oh, 
Wow, he done struck us all. Chris has struck us all quiet. He has no, I mean, the, I, I, you saw the difference. I, 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 I want to hear another poem. That's so, true. I'll ask the last question after the poem. After the poem. We are all going to, we going to all exit and leave Chris the floor. Yep, and I'll come back and ask you the last question. Holla. <laughs> okay. So this poem is titled Trinity. It's written in three parts and it came from a writing prompt that was given to me by Naya. Um, but I flipped it around to fit me. Um, is introducing myself in three different forms. One from birth, one through question statements, and through I am statements. <clears throat> Born on a Thursday at the crack of night, where an evening sky knew his name before it was law. Bowed before heaven, a mixture of souls played airbender, breathing life into what his grace allowed to lay upon thee. Held together by prayer, kept secret by sin, a collection of hymns stashed in the creases of a smile bound by scripture, a reflection of their mother's imperfections and the footprints of their father's flaws, is the blessing born on a Thursday at the crack of night where an evening sky knew their name before it was law. Part two, have I always settled for less than I deserve? Have I given of myself freely? Have I held sorrow in the form of strangers? Have I ignored red flags waving in danger? Have I sacrificed my existence to become void? Have I forgotten me to memorize you? Have I realized you never loved me? Have I known this, but was too afraid? Have I forgiven myself completely? Have I owned my insecurities? Have I become the person I knew I'd be? Have I always known this, but was too afraid? Well, part three. I am fire laughing at water. I am sound climbing off the walls of teeth. I am a star guiding the waves of oceans. I am joy filled with faith of a mustard seed. I am testimony on tried and true days. I am gospel hummed over Sunday dinner. I am a lotus pushing through the thickest of mud. I am shelter from the coldest of winters. I am ending generational trauma. I am my past and my present birthing my destiny. I am the harmony from your favorite song. I am not afraid of your weapons formed against me. I am alive on purpose. I am purpose ferociously. I am all I never could imagine. I am magnificently me. That's the poem. I love that. Whatever you say after I am, you are. I love it. Oh, we're doing, we doing a round of applause. We already doing a round of applause. Round of applause. All right. I, 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 standing ovation. Can't do that from here. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit you with this last one. And then we're good. You've survived again. <laughs> The more intense version. <laughs> um, right, right, right. <laughs> Round two, fight. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I don't think we had this question when we started this. It didn't come in for a couple of episodes. So this is actually the first time I've asked you this question, but you've heard it before, of course. And I always call this the hardest question we ask on the show. Now that you've experienced the entire roundtable, so, and you've been here before in my segment, who do you think make a good guess on this show. Whose brain would you like to see us pick? Huh. Um, <clears throat> Misfit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Misfit, because he, again, he's quiet and he's reserved. 
Mm. And I pick his brain time to time. So yes, misfit. Got it. Got it. We will we will get y'all are not familiar. Genuinely one of the nicest people you will ever meet in life. That is true. He is so nice. Oh my God, he is so nice. That is true. That is very true. Genuinely, genuinely good dude. This this chat is is blowed up with all the little lines from your last poem. I can't even I can't even show them all. I mean, people just right. repeating the lines because obviously it resonated right. with that our is true. Me... So as we do all at this time again, let's give let's please give our applause and thank you to C. Thomas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we thank you again for joining us and taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us tonight. We will be back next week with Let's Talk About the... Uh, it'll be book. It'll be a book? Did, did it'll, we... be, it'll, be, it'll be books and, and a, a few other things. So I'm excited. Have we confirmed okay. who or are we just still... No, 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 yeah. no, not yet, not yet. I'll, okay. I'll drop, I'll drop come back for a surprise. It's a surprise. surprise. So come back. So no, I know so what I this is what you, you know can do. What we're dealing with. I just want to make sure I can get it. I can get it like down together we good cool All right. can, I, can i say one more thing and get c thomas yes. to say one more thing Please. i was gonna say it anyway first of all i want to say scrolling at the bottom of your screen is the cash app for c thomas please please listen no amount is too little put some cash in there you can wait till you get paid screenshot it and then put some cash in there visit the website and i must ask how other than this that i have said c thomas can people support you let's end on that please well as always a good follow on the ig is always accepted you know because follows matter and i do follow back i do not believe in collecting follows because i do not believe in human trafficking it's against the law so i will follow you back um what is your ig because i don't think it's i don't think it's on on the ticker it's C. Thomas Works. Okay. It is, yeah, C. Thomas Works. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, I, and of course, I, of course, I put a typo in it, so I'm going to do it again. <laughs> but yes, it is um, C. Thomas Works. Um, I am on Twitter. I try to tweet every now and then when I want to get a good thought out, something quick. Mm -hmm. um, also, Facebook. Um, but I, I'm not on Facebook, Facebook. Every now and then I pop back up. But, you know, you can follow my fan page, which is C. Alexandria Bernard Thomas. Um, and also share what I'm doing because I'm always available for teaching. I'm always available for workshops. I'm always available for performances. I'm always available for even. He's a dynamic speaker. I'll plug right now. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I just I just love interacting with people. And that's <clears throat> more so out of artistry. If I get to show one person who they are outside of what they were taught to believe, I've yeah. done my job. Oh. Ashe, Ashe, Ashe. And I, I, I think that's, 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 that's nothing else to say. That's nothing else to say. Everybody, stay safe. Safe. Wash your hands. See you next week. <laughs> if you want to find out who's featuring with us next week, sign up on our email list at keepthemicon.com. That's literally Follow what I was say. Sign on, up uh, Facebook or YouTube, you know, like, subscribe our pages because we will announce everything will be out by middle of the week. Yes. And, and I was going to say, I was just about to say that's a good segue to go. If you really want to know, how about your follows? Do all the follows. We are keep the mic going on everything so far. On all social and, and media. get the back episodes on Spotify and, and YouTube and Facebooks and all the things. Okay. All right. <laughs> See everybody next week. Good night. Yeah. Good night,